Order. Senator Farrell, you'll be in continuation upon resumption. Senator Cormann. If to make a statement regarding ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Uh, thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Mackenzie will be absent from question time today uh, for personal reasons. Uh, in Senator Mackenzie's absence, Senator Canavan will represent the Minister for Agriculture and the Minister for Water Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management. I'll let senators take their seats before we get to question time. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. In dismissing questions about the record low wage growth Australians are experiencing, the Minister could only refer to the Labor Party 20 times. Not once did the Minister outline any economic plan to reverse record low wage growth. Is the Minister in denial about record low wage growth, or does the government just not care about Australians who are working harder but going backwards. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, firstly, I completely reject the premise of the question. I completely reject the premise of the question. The only people in the Senate, the only people in the Senate that are com in complete denial, are the Australian Labor Party. Are the Australian Labor Party? They are in Order. complete denial about Order. the fact. Senator Cormann, uh, before, Senator Watt. Before I take you point of order, can I ask senators that can we at least make the first minute of question time before I have to call senators to order so I can hear the minister's answer? Senator Watt, on a point of order. Mr. President, I simply want to point out that it took the minister 15 seconds that is to not get a to point Labor. Of order, Senator so Watt. Um, se well, se se Senator Wong, I'll, I'll take the interjection from you, Senator Wong. In this case. The, minister, the question referenced the minister's answer yesterday and a claim about the number of times he mentioned another party. It is, dire it is directly relevant for the minister to be able to address that uh, claim in answering this question. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I would just remind uh, the Australian people that in 2013, on coming into government, we inherited a weakening economy, rising unemployment, with the unemployment rate re headed past six and a quarter per cent, and indeed a rapidly deteriorating budget position. We were able to turn that situation around. And let me just say that the increasing trajectory of unemployment we inherited from Labor was a key ingredient for a softening in wages growth when we came into government. And since then, we have actually, as a result of our policies, as a result of our plan, Order. been able, been able to build, create more jobs. 1.4 million more new jobs, an unemployment rate down to 5.2 per cent. Which is Senator Cormann, Senator Watt, on, a, on your point of order, Senator Watt? It is on relevance. The question was simply whether the minister was in denial about record oh. low wage growth or whether he doesn't care. Thank, Senator Watt. And he hasn't, clearly hasn't chosen Senator one of those Watt, two options. No, Senator Watt, please. I provide some liberality when it comes to people raising points of order, but I expect an attempt to be made that it's a point of order. That was part of the question, Senator Watt. The minister is entitled to be directly relevant. The minister is Senator, Senators on my left, while I'm ruling, it might help with questions. Senators answer, ministers answering questions are entitled to be directly relevant to any part of the question. In this case, the minister is. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As I said uh, in my opening remarks, uh, the only political party in complete denial uh, is uh, the Australian Labor Party, because they are in complete denial about the judgment of the Australian people about who had the better plan for our economy. They chose Order. our plan for lower taxes, pro-growth, pro-business, pro-jobs, pro-opportunity, pro-aspiration, and they voted against Order. your socialist agenda, which the Australian people understand would have made the economy weaker and would have made all Australians poorer. Order. And you, the sooner you actually accept that fact, the sooner you accept the verdict of the Australian people, the better for you and the better for the Australian people. Now, let me talk about why just more. Senator. Senator Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance. Do you care about the low Senator, wage growth Senator, Australians are struggling Senator with? Wong, Why don't you have the guts Senator to Wong, answer that please question? Please resume your seat. On the, on, the direct, on the point of order, Senator Wong? I'll take the point Senator of order, Wong. Mr. President. I will resume my seat, but question time is becoming a mockery. If all he can do as the leader of the government is, a, is talk about the Australian Labor Party, Senator, they should be governing. Senator Wong. I, I'm, I, on the point of order first, I remind senators on my left 
that a minister can be directly relevant to any part of the question. And in this case, given the question, the minister is being directly relevant. There is a time for debating questions after question time and other opportunities in this place. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. 1.4 million new jobs under us, the unemployment rate, which was set at past six and a quarter under Labor, down to 5.2 per cent, and wages growth the strongest it has been since 2013 and 14, the last financial year that Labor delivered a budget. Order. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you. And I, I, note, I note so far Senator Cormann is up to mentioning Labor seven times. Uh, despite Senator Cormann dismissing concerns about the floundering economy under his government's leadership, Senator Payne characterised wage growth under the coalition as, and I quote, very subdued. Is Senator Payne correct? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. The first thing I would say is that the only thing that is floundering is Labor's socialist policy agenda. That is Order. the only thing that's floundering. Order. Um, Senator Wong, I, can I anticipate your point on direct relevance? My, the minister is allowed to finish a sentence and include a, a, a comment in a sentence. We have got seven seconds into the answer. I'll let the minister continue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As uh, Senator Payne and I yesterday pointed out, wages growth is running, real wages growth is running above inflation. 2.3 per cent wages growth in the context of 1.6 per cent inflation. It is the strongest wages growth since 2013 order, 14. Senator which was Cormann on a point of order. Senator Wong. Mr. President, the question, it's interesting. This, uh, the, the, I, the point of order is direct relevance. The, minister, the leader of the government can choose to back his minister or not. She said very subdued. Does he agree? Um, that, is the nature of the that is the specific wording of the question, Senator Wong. I, I do think the minister talking about the subject matter of the question being wage growth does qualify in my definition of directly relevant to the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I again remind the Senate and the Australian people that Labor, after six years of bad government, left behind rising unemployment. We turned that situation around. We increased employment growth, 1.4 million new jobs, the unemployment rate down to 5.2 per cent, which is an important ingredient to stronger wages growth into the future. And indeed, wages growth in 2018-19 at 2.3 per cent is the strongest it has ever been. And let me say we're doing even better. We are delivering income tax cuts to the Australian people. Income tax relief increases. Incre well, he says they're not wages. They're not wages. You know what matters Order. to the Australian people? Senator it's what Cormann, ends up in their please pocket. Please resume your seat. Time for the answer has expired. Order. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the minister has admitted that low wage growth is, and I quote, a deliberate design feature. Isn't the coalition's only economic plan to keep wages low? Senator Cormann. That is a complete misrepresentation of what I said. No, that is a complete misrepresentation of what I said. When we came into government, we inherited rising unemployment. And the point I made at the time, and that used to be something that under Hawke and Keating, the Labor Party used to believe in too, that, that it, is actually, it is actually desirable to keep unemployment lower by allowing wages to adjust in the context of prevailing economic conditions. And that is what happened after you let the unemployment rate go up and up and up. But let me tell you, wages growth under us is stronger Order. than it has been at any time since 2013-14, which was your last financial year when you delivered a budget. But the strongest it has been, it is running above inflation. We would like it to be even stronger, and that will only happen as a result of our plan to build a stronger economy and create more jobs. Let me tell you, when even an, an old socialist like the member for Port Adelaide is criticising the Labor Party for having gone too far to the left, the Australian people know that the Labor Party has a problem. Order. Order. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Today is World Suicide Prevention Day. Can the Minister please update the Senate about how the government is investing in improving mental health of all Australians and preventing suicide? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Van for the question on what I think we all agree is an incredibly serious issue. Uh, Mr President, as Senator Van said, today is World Suicide Prevention Day. 
Uh, this is one of those issues where, in this place, we are all united in our determination to see the scourge of suicide on our community ended. Suicide is the leading cause of death for Australians between the ages of 15 and 44. Regrettably, in 2017, more than 3,100 Australians died by suicide. Suicide Prevention Australia released research in June this year, and it shows that suicide can have a large ripple effect throughout the community, with 56 per cent of Australians personally knowing someone who has died by suicide, including 61 per cent in rural and regional communities. These figures are of deep concern, and the government is committed to reversing this trend. Every life is important, and we must do what we can to prevent suicide. The government has adopted a towards zero target. We believe that a target of zero suicides is the only acceptable target. We have appointed Christine Morgan as Australia's first national suicide prevention adviser to the Prime Minister, who will work with the government on our towards zero target and culture. Over the next 15 months, Christine, supported by a national suicide prevention task force, will be working to better coordinate efforts in health, finance, social services, employment and education, and deliver a whole of government response to suicide and its impacts. This is a serious issue, and the Morrison government, led by our Prime Minister, is committed to doing everything we Order. can to reduce Senator suicide. Cash. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Yes, Minister, what additional measures is the government taking to improve suicide prevention in Australia? Senator Cash. Thank you again for the question, Senator Van. Uh, in the recent budget, Mr. President, we announced a $503 million youth and Indigenous mental health and suicide prevention package. We're investing $375 million to expand the Headspace network. 20 of the 30 new Headspace sites will be in rural and regional Australia, mm -hmm. ensuring that those in need have better access to services. We've committed $34 million to strengthen Indigenous youth suicide prevention, including support to ensure our health care system delivers culturally appropriate care and services, recognising the value of community, cultural artistic traditions and protective social factors. We're also investing $15 million for the establishment of a real-time suicide and self-harm monitoring system to enable governments and communities to respond rapidly in the areas of high incidence. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Could the minister provide an example of the sort of programs the government is funding to address this very serious issue? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, and yes, I can. And in fact, an example of one program benefiting from the government's record investment is BATIA. BATIA was actually launched in 2011 uh, after founder of the actual uh, organisation, Sebastian Robertson experienced the frustration and isolation of living silently with mental ill health whilst at university. Sebastian recognised the need to have open, honest conversations about mental health with young people and founded the organisation, naming it after Batia, the talking elephant from Kazakhstan. Batia is all about confronting the elephant in the room, and that is suicide. BATIA will receive a $2.8 million boost from the Morrison government to expand its interactive school-based programs through a new digital storytelling platform. Mr President, this is a serious issue and the government will walk to work Order. towards Senator a Cash. zero tolerance. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Yesterday in question time, the Treasurer said, and I quote, the gender pay gap has closed. Is the Treasurer correct? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McAllister for her question. Uh, I think uh, anyone with a basic appreciation of uh, the trajectory of the gender pay gap understands, and I'll explain uh, this uh, for those opposite, that the gender pay gap 
whilst still too wide, Mr. President, is absolutely heading in the right direction. The latest figures of the gender pay gap, Mr. President, show that it has fallen to 14 per cent, which is a record low. Indeed, it's fallen by 3.2 percentage points since November of 2013. And it was only last year, Mr. President, for the first time the government produced uh, a women's economic security statement, of which we were very proud, led by my former colleague, the then Minister for Women, the Hon. Kelly O'Dwyer. And that statement contained a range of initiatives to further close the gender pay gap by boosting women's earning potential. It provided uh, $8.6 million in additional funding to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency to make workplace gender reporting easier. Order, Senator Payne. Senator McAllister on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My point of order is relevance. I was asking whether or not the minister considers that the Treasurer's remarks yesterday were correct, and she has not answered that question. You reminded the minister of that part of the question. With respect, I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question as long as the minister is being directly relevant. In my view, discussing the issues of the gender pay gap, which you referenced in your question, which the minister is discussing in some detail, is directly relevant, but you've reminded the minister of the part of the question you wished highlighted. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, I want to reinforce the uh, statements I've made, Mr President, about the Women's Economic Security Statement, because what the statement contained, as I advised the Chamber, but those opposite apparently are, are disinterested in, was a range of initiatives to further close the gender pay gap by boosting order. women's earning Senator potential. Payne. Senator Wong on a point of order. One of order is direct relevance. We're not disinterested in women's issues. We had a women's budget statement, which you stopped. We are interested in you being relevant to the question. Could the minister respond? To the question, please. As I said, Senator Wong, I think I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question. In this case, it was a very tightly worded question. I am listening very carefully to the minister, and the minister has, as far as I have heard, for one and a half minutes spoken about the very issue raised in the question, that being the gender pay gap. I cannot instruct the minister to provide an answer that a question asker would prefer. I have to keep them directly relevant. I think, in my view, the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I know those opposite don't want to hear about the successes that the government has had in ensuring that trajectory of the trajectory of the gender pay gap is in a downward direction. Mr. President. Let me reiterate that it has fallen by 3.2 percentage points since November 2013, Mr. President. Now that means under this government it has fallen by 3.2 percentage order. points. Senator, and on Payne, its Senator Wong on a point of order. Seven seconds. I wonder if the minister could ask, answer the question as to whether the Treasurer was correct when, the, when he said the, the gender pay gap has closed. Senator, Senator Payne has completed her answer. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Senator Payne, how much less do Australian women earn on average per week than men? Senator Payne. Um, well, they do indeed. The finance minister is quite right. They earn $1,100 more now than they did before, thanks to the initiatives of this government, Mr. President, which were fought tooth and nail by those opposite. And, Mr. President, indeed, since the coalition came to office, the minimum wage has never dropped below inflation. When Labor was last in office, those on the minimum wage were hit by real wage cuts three out of six years. Order. Real wage Senator cuts Payne, under please, those opposite, Mr. Please President. Resume your seat. Senator, Senator Payne, please resume your seat. Senator McAllister. Sen can I hear the point of order first? Senator McAllister. My point of order is direct relevance. It's a tightly worded question that goes to how much less Australian women earn on average per week than men. Um, on the point of order, this is a very tightly worded question that essentially seeks a factual answer. Um, I, I will ask the minister, who has been given half a minute to address broader issues, to turn to the specific nature of the question. Senator Payne. Well, I was actually turning to the specific nature of the question, Mr. President, because, of course, the minimum wage reflects, of course, payments across uh, all. Order, Senator Wong. I, I need the minister to be able to finish a sentence before I can make a ruling on direct relevance. Senator Wong. That's a very good one, actually. No, well, Mr. President, the minister is actually being utterly disrespectful to the warning you just gave her, and you should call her. You should call her to Senator, order. Senator, I, I wouldn't characterise my. 
Senator Cormann on the I point mean, of uh, order. Uh, uh, like, S Senator Wong should apologise for that reflection on Senator Wong just now. Uh, Senator Payne is, uh, as she always does, uh, answering uh, in a way that is directly relevant and courteous, not only uh, to uh, Senator Wong but to the Senate. And I would ask uh, that uh, you require Senator Wong to withdraw that imputation on the Senator in this chamber. Um, I, I didn't hear an imputation. I will say to Senator Wong, I would appreciate if those didn't characterise my rulings with terms like warning, I would not have characterised what I just said to Senator Payne as a warning. Um, however, I will ask ministers, when they are asked for factual answers, oh sorry Senator Cormann, I did, you're asking for something to be withdrawn. I mean, yep. Senator Wong knows precisely the imputation that she has made in relation to Senator Payne and I would, like, I would ask you uh, to uh, consider the hands out uh, and hopefully will... the interjection were picked up and to come back to the chamber because there's now been a barrage of disorderly interjecting on a continuous basis over the last 20 minutes and quite frankly I think that what is starting to become quite unbecoming is the level of disorderly interjection coming from the other side. I, I will say we, yes, Senator Wong. Thank you Mr President. I'm always uh, happy if the, if the president wishes to, if you wish to look at the hand side, I'll always abide by the ruling you make, Mr. President. So I'm happy for you to do so, and uh, I'll respond respond accordingly. Um, I would make the point that, uh, and for the benefit of the leader of the government and perhaps the chamber, the reason, in part, in large part, that you are seeing interjections is senators on this side do not believe, and I think it is objectively dem demonstrable, that ministers are actually answering questions. And question time is for a government to be held to account. The opposition is entitled to ask questions. Uh, I think the Australian public and the Westminster system expects answers. Ministers are not answering questions, and you are seeing a response accordingly. I I'll take Senator Cormann before I make some rulings and observations. Well, Senator f f firstly, rulings in relation to what is consistent with standing orders in terms of ministerial answers are a matter for the president, not for the leader of the opposition, with the greatest of respect to my friend and colleague Senator Wong. Uh, and and secondly, secondly, when there are uh, clearly partisan political questions being asked, uh, the Labour Party should not be surprised when they invite a somewhat more political answer than would otherwise be the case. Can I make it? I think it's got to the point. But we're sort of 30 all between you and Senator Cormann, Senator Wong. Um, I'd like to make some. <laughs> Sen Senator Wong. I, I appreciate your patience. The last comment that was made by the government leader was that questions invited political answers. This, as you pointed out, is an entirely factual question about an amount. An entirely factual question about an amount, and which the minister, I'm sure, could have Googled in the time we've been arguing about the point of order. So we have made some observations, generally and specifically. If I could start generally, um, Senator Wong, complaints from the opposition regarding um, governments and question time uh, are not unique to either side of the chamber, and I. I have not, while it has been noisier in the last two days since we resumed from the winter break, I haven't detected myself a noticeable difference in question time other than the amount of noise. Um, when, now when I, when, I come to, when I come to Senator Cormann's point about the claimed, the claimed observation he wanted withdrawn, I didn't hear it. I'll look at the Hansard and I'll approach senators. If there is something recorded that um, we didn't, Senator Cormann may have heard, uh, said something he heard. I'll see what I can find out. On this particular question, um, on other questions today, there has been more broadly worded introductions to the questions that, in my view, have allowed the ministers to be directly relevant to the question and provide some of the comments, Senator Wong, that um, you've highlighted that you don't think are appropriate, but I think are directly relevant. On this particular question, there has been, in my, the way I've interpreted it and recorded it, is it was seeking a, a fact from a minister. Um, to be directly relevant to a question like that, one must be speaking about the fact. Um, one does have the right as a minister to provide some context around that, which is why answers are not just 10 seconds, they can be a minute long. Um, so I'll ask the minister and remind the minister of the specific fact sought by um, the per Senator McAllister asking the question. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And if I had been allowed to finish my response, Mr. President, I was going to observe that the gender pay gap can be influenced by a number of factors, 
and currently all industries continue to have a gender pay gap in favour of men. What Wajia says uh, or assesses, Mr. President, in terms of full-time average weekly earnings, uh, is that FTAWE for women currently $1,484.50, and for men $1,726.30. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, data from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency reveals that the full-time total remuneration gap is 21.3 per cent, meaning that men working full-time earn nearly $25,717 a year more than a woman working full-time. Does the minister share the Treasurer's view that women earning $25,000 less than men reflects a pay gap that has closed? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I know that all members of this government, all members of this government, are focused on ensuring that the gender pay gap is closing. Is heading in the trajectory that I've described before, Mr. President, which is a 3.2% closing since we were elected in 2013. That is in marked contrast to the efforts of those opposite, Mr. President. And importantly, what we do when working with Wajia and working within government initiatives is to introduce new opportunities for women to engage in the workforce, new opportunities for women to advance in the workforce in a real and serious way, unlike those opposite. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Resources, who today is representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management. Minister, in April this year, 23 chiefs of emergency services representing every state and territory pleaded with the federal government to act on the climate breakdown because they're no longer equipped to defend Australia against the escalated risk of these climate-related disasters. Minister, your government's ignored them. Your government has called their concerns irrelevant. Your government has made the risks that they are confronting worse by mining more coal, oil and gas. Minister, will you now apologise to the people of Queensland who have lost their homes in these devastating, unpre unprecedented near-winter bushfires? Order. And will you apologise to the emergency service right. workers who put their lives at risk to protect them? I'll ask for order on my right during the question being asked. The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Di Natale for his questions. There's quite a few premises in that question that I uh, fundamentally disagree with. Uh, the first and most important point to make is that the government is uh, taking action to reduce Australia's carbon emissions and doing so in a way in cooperation with the rest of the world. Uh, the best way we can respond, of course, to uh, issues around climate change is to do so in unison and cooperation with the rest of the world, is what we, which we are doing. A second point to make about Senator Di Natale's question and contributions to base how insensitive it is, uh, Mr. President, uh, for him to be uh, going out like this in such an insightful and combustible fashion while people are still defending their homes. He is, there's not an opportunity that Dina, to Senator Di Natale sorry, misses to embarrass himself on these issues, Mr. President. He constantly uses people's tragedy, uh, people's difficulty in tough circumstances to further his own political cause. And, Mr President, he mentioned a number of groups in his question. Well, I think it is better, rather than uh, uh, paraphrasing others, to directly quote from some. And I'm quoting here from a New South Wales government uh, Department of Environment uh, investigation on the link between climate change and bushfire risk. And this is what the New South Wales government bigger bureaucrats um, say in a much more sensible way than Senator Di Natale has. They say there is considerable uncertainty concerning the impacts of climate change on bushfire risk, and I won't be able to quote it all, but summarising this research to determine the overall influence of climate change on bushfire risk is in, in New South Wales is difficult. There is a clear need to integrate many diverse strands of evidence, including many interactions and feedbacks. However, broadly speaking, the potential for significant increases in bushfire risk appears greater than the potential for equivalent decreases. That is a, that is a, that is a sensible summary of the evidence in this field. That is what, how we should approach these complex and difficult issues that impact people's lives, not the narrow base political exercise that the Greens seem to, seem to exercise in every one of these debates, Mr President. It is not the right approach when dealing with these issues. The government is make, making sensible decisions on this to respond to climate change Order. and, of course, Senator protect Canada people's Bad. homes. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question? Uh, Minister, one of the things that this delegation of 23 emergency service chiefs was requesting was a meeting with the Prime Minister. Minister, will the Prime Minister meet with this delegation, 
or does he agree with Minister Littleproud that their concerns are, and I quote, irrelevant? Senator Canavan. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, uh, Mr. President, um, what I know the Prime Minister and the government is focused on doing is making sure we make sensible decisions in this area, which I've outlined into the first uh, question. I'm not aware of the, the delegation specifically, but that's obviously a question that Senator Natale can put to others in this place. I know the focus of the government has been, and the minister in this case has been providing what is relevant at the moment is providing emergency relief to people in these circumstances. And what we need to focus on in the future too is making sure. Order, Senator Natale, on a point of order. Point of order on relevance is a very narrow question. Would the, will the prime minister meet with these emergency service chiefs? Will um, the Prime Minister meet or will he dismiss their concerns yeah, as irrelevant? Yeah. Very um, straightforward question. He can take it on notice if he doesn't know the answer, uh, Mr Senator, President. Senator um, Di Natale, yeah, you're quite right to highlight the second part of the question. I'll listen, I'm listening carefully to the Minister. Um, you reminded him of the nature of your question and I'll call him to continue. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr President. As I was saying, Mr President, what is important now is that we also focus on ways to make sure that risk is reduced for people, including because of greater bushfire risks. And I refer uh, the chamber to a report by the Inspector General of Queensland to, into Queensland's fires recently. He's made a recommendation saying that given the increasing risk of intense fires, the framework of legislation relating to vegetation management uh, should be reassessed. Uh, and that is something that the Greens oppose, Mr. President. They are not allowing farmers and local landowners to reduce Canavan. their risk Senator to Senator Natale, a final supplementary that question. Can do, mate? Uh, look, I'll ask uh, the minister a simple question I asked of. Uh, Minister Mackenzie yesterday, and I'd like the minister's opinion on it. Minister, do you agree with this simple proposition that the single biggest cause of climate change is the mining and burning of coal, and that climate change will increase the frequency and severity of bushfires? It's a very narrow question, no mealy mouth response. I'm asking as to whether you agree with that simple and straightforward proposition. <laughs> Senator Canavan. So, Mr. President, well, I don't agree with uh, many parts of what Senator Di Natale is saying here, Mr. President, because I do not agree. What well, we support uh, on this side of the change is sensible responses to climate change that include support for the high quality coal and gas that we produce in this country, because it is through the high quality production of energy that we will respond to climate change and reduce the global emissions. The Greens, Mr. President, only want to shut down, only campaign on coal mines here in this country. That's their focus, focus on shutting down jobs in this nation, not the rest of the world. So I reject, Mr. President, the way Senator Di Natale characterises these debates, because we should continue to support the clean, environmentally sustainable mining practices in this country and support those and the resources we supply to the rest of the world, because that is what we are doing to make sure that the whole world responds to climate change. Any, the, the approach of the Greens would be, would be counterproductive to that effort, Mr. President, because it would force production to countries that do not have the same environmental standards. Our approach is much more sensible and more important has been vindicated Senator by the Australian Canada. people. Senator Bragg. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the importance of the stability and certainty in the government's trade policy which is creating more exporting businesses and jobs. The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Bragg for his question and his passionate advocacy on behalf of Australian businesses and particularly exporters. And I'm very pleased to inform the Senate. The recent ABS data shows that uh, over, uh, over the course of the last year, more than 1,000 additional Australian businesses became exporting businesses of merchandise goods from Australia. That takes to more than 53,000 the number of Australian businesses exporting to the world and is, in fact, growth of some 8,200 over the period of time since our government came to office. That's an 18.5 per cent increase in the number of exporting businesses projecting from Australia out to the world and seizing opportunities. And pleasingly, though Senator Bragg hails from our largest state, Pleasingly, the most significant proportionate increase has come from our smallest states. Tasmania led with a 17 per cent increase in the number of exporting businesses, South Australia with a close to 16 per cent increase. And the majority of these businesses are small and medium-sized businesses who are getting out to the world and selling Australian goods to the world. What they're doing is, of course, supporting Australian jobs in doing so. One in five Australian jobs is now trade-dependent. And it's estimated that over the last five years, 240,000 additional jobs have been created.
that are trade-related jobs in Australia. And that's because we've got more businesses exporting, more businesses out there growing the value of those exports. And in the month of July, Australia posted another record level of exports for both goods at $34.2 billion and for services at $8.4 billion. We also posted our second highest ever trade surplus as a nation. That's trade surpluses in 27 out of the last 29 months for Australia, or now 19 straight monthly trade surpluses. A trade surplus for the 2018-19 financial year of $50 billion, all of it fuelled very much by export growth that is creating more opportunities right across Australia. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Will the minister please inform the Senate about how trade is helping build a strong economy? which provides the essential services which we all rely upon. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. And, uh, and indeed, that type of growth in exports, which I was speaking about before, isn't something we celebrate just for a statistical trade surplus. We celebrate it because the fuelling of record exports is growing Australian businesses. Those businesses are able to employ more Australians. They pay more tax. They fund the services that we rely upon. They help strengthen our budget position. They reduce the reliance of Australians on welfare because of the job creation activities that are undertaken. Let's take, Mr. President, let's take Bega Cheese, a business that I was pleased to visit with Senator Bragg recently in rural New South Wales, benefiting from Australian free trade agreements, or others like Stormtech, based in South Nowra, who said very clearly that Australia's FTAs provide us with countless benefits and opportunities to distribute our products on the international stage. They're part of so many businesses exporting so much more right across our region thanks to the network of trade agreements that our government has negotiated, creating more opportunities for more businesses to walk through that door Order. and export more Senator Australian Birmingham. goods to the world. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Minister, how will our upcoming free trade agreements, such as those with uh, Indonesia and Hong Kong, ensure stability and certainty for exporters and service providers and help Australians into jobs. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, the growth and success we've seen is partly because of the network of trade agreements, but this is a government not resting on its laurels. We're looking to expand that network and, critically, before the parliament at the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties at present uh, are our proposed agreements uh, with Indonesia and with Hong Kong. Under the Indonesian agreement, over 99 per cent of Australia's goods exports will enter Indonesia duty-free or under preferential arrangements under our proposed agreement. And the evidence to Jay Scott has widely welcomed that. The National Farmers Federation described it as providing greater certainty for agricultural exporters. The dairy industry said the Indonesia agreement is worth about $6.5 million per annum just on existing exports. That's before they seek to grow the market. The grains industry said it was equivalent to more than 12,000 individual truckloads of Australian grain, which in dollar terms is a new grain feed quota worth over $125 million to Australian farmers. These are real tangible benefits to our farmers and businesses, and our government's determined to keep opening and creating Order, those Birmingham. opportunities for them. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. The Department of Home Affairs invited Paladin, a company registered to a beach shack on Kangaroo Island, to be the sole tenderer for garrison and security services at Manus Island. The $532 million Paladin contract is the second largest in the Department of Home Affairs. A senior Home Affairs official recently told Senate Estimates in February that the Department was, and I quote, quite happy with the services provided by Paladin. Does the minister agree the government is quite happy with the services provided by Paladin? The minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, I thank Senator Keneally for the question, even though, as I responded yesterday in answer to a question uh, on this side of the chamber, what is the greatest threat to border protection in Australia? And my response was the shadow minister uh, sitting opposite. Uh, Senator Keneally, yesterday, uh, in response to a question asked by Senator Hanson, I explained to the Senate that, as you would now know, on 30 August 2019, at the request of the PNG Immigration and Citizenship Authority, the contract for Paladin Holdings was terminated for convenience with an effective end date of 30 November 2019. I also, I also have provided further information in terms of 
what the department actually does in terms of the performance management of the contract to ensure delivery of services on behalf of PNG and ICA. And the information is that the active management of the performance management framework and the identification and rectification of service failures demonstrate sound contract and fiscal management and ensures services are maintained at required levels. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Documents recently tabled in the Senate show that Paladin service failures occurred over 1,000 times in 18 months and included such poor maintenance that a home affairs official actually fell through rotting floorboards during a pre-arranged inspection. Is the minister quite happy with 1,000 instances of performance failures in just 18 months, a rate of almost two a day? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mer uh, President. Well, Senator Keneally, as I said in my answer to your previous question, the department operates a rigorous performance management framework to ensure delivery of services on behalf of PNG ICA. The active management of the performance management framework and the identification order. and rectification. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Direct relevant, Mr. President. Uh, twice now I have asked the minister specifically if the minister agrees that the government is quite happy with the services. She has repeated the same answer she gave in the first question. I ask you to direct her to the question. Um, Senator Keneally, I was listening to the minister, and that was the conclusion of your question. I think the minister was being directly relevant to the earlier part of the question about the performance of the contract you were quoting, but I will continue to listen very carefully. Senator Cash. As I was saying, Mr President, the performance management framework and the identification and rectification of service failures demonstrate sound contract and fiscal management and ensure services are maintained at required levels. Higher level of abatements during the initial period of contracts are not unexpected, and Paladin demonstrated continuous improvement in meeting service standards during the course of the contract through transition and normal operations. The abatements I am instructed often related to relatively minor administrative failures. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Australian workers and small business owners are paying Paladin $20 million a month through their taxes under the direction of the Minister for Home Affairs as a result of this contract awarded without a competitive tender. Can you provide one example of how the minister is quite happy with the services Paladin has provided. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, I would refer Senator Keneally to the answers I gave to both her initial question and supplementary question because they actually did provide that example. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can the Minister please explain how important stability and certainty is in Australia's resources sector? and how Australia has registered its first account surplus in more than 40 years. The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Davey for her question. recognise her long-standing support for our fantastic resources sector in this country. And Senator Pavey is right to highlight the fact that, uh, that over the, the last week or so, the, uh, Australia has achieved its first current account surplus for, uh, as she says, 40, 44 years back in 1975. It was the last time. Uh, that, uh, that uh, a current account surplus was achieved here in Australia, and the resources sector played a big role in achieving that—a big role. Because just a few years ago, uh, our, uh, Mr. President, our resource sector exports were below $180 billion. And at the time, there were people out there saying that, "Oh, this is the end," and, and those opposite me here saying, "We don't need resources anymore. We don't. Uh, we don't. They're not, they're not important for our economy anymore." Well, just in the space of a few years, uh, Mr. President, just a couple of years, in fact. Our exports uh, last financial year of resources and energy hit nearly $280 billion, so up nearly $100 billion in the space of just a couple of years, and, and given uh, our current account surplus uh, was uh, just ticked over zero, that, that contribution was quite significant. 
to run through what has happened in the last few years. Our iron ore exports were below $50 billion a few years ago. They're up to almost hitting $70 billion in the last financial year. Our coal exports were at $35 billion a few years ago. They're now at $65 billion. And, and our gas exports have quadrupled in volumes as uh, we've had $200 billion of investment in our gas sector, and we now export $50 billion worth of gas. Just those top three, Mr. President, just those top three now of gas, coal and iron ore account for more of our exports combined than all other goods exports as a total. So it's a huge contribution to our economy. And I know that Senator Davey knows very well how important it is that government support uh, the resources sector, like the coal sector in her state. And I visited uh, some coal mines there in the Hunter Valley with her just in the last few weeks to reiterate that support. It's why we need to oppose the agenda of the Greens who want to shut all this down and take away all this wealth from our country, and then what are we going to do? We're not going to have jobs, and we're going to be much poorer Senator for it. Canavan. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. And can the minister explain the growth markets and opportunities for Australian resources and how the Liberal and Nationals in government are pursuing those opportunities? Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, our, our, our growth in resource exports has all been on the back of, or largely on the back of, economic growth in our region. Uh, long may that continue. Uh, we've successfully attracted investment from, from Japan, from Korea, and China. We should take pride as a country in what we provide to those countries in helping those nations develop their economies and take hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Now, hopefully, we will continue to do that, Mr. President. Hopefully, economic growth does continue in our region. We can't control that completely. But we do know that India, for example, is the fastest major growing country in the world uh, at the moment. It's got enormous prospects to continue to grow and develop. There remains nearly 170 million people in India without, uh, without access to electricity. And, and I hope that our great coal mining sector can play a role in helping bring electricity for the first time uh, to people in our region. It's one of the biggest things you can do to help people's health outcomes, educational outcomes, is let them have access to electricity. India also has enormous needs to grow apartments and build housing. Our coking coal will be needed for that. And that's why I visited India in the last couple of weeks to stress those opportunities, to attract those investments and create jobs here in Australia. Senator Davey, a final supplementary And finally, question. Minister, what are the global prospects for Australia's coal industry and what are the impediments standing in the way of the continued growth? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, there continues to be very strong demand for, for our high-quality coal, and that will likely continue given the fact that it is, it is of high energy content and generally of low ash, uh, which is suiting the needs of countries in our regions who want to improve environmental outcomes in their region, including around air quality, not just on climate change. So that demand will continue. The IEA predicts that uh, the International Energy Agency predicts that demand will increase by over 400 million tonnes in this region in the next couple of decades. A huge opportunity for our country. What we need, though, is that certainty and stability in decision making. We have an absurd situation at the moment where a coal mine in Queensland is being held up by the Queensland government, the new Ackland Stage 3 mine, the New Hope mine. It's being held up for approvals because there's a court case going on being brought by green activists. It's part of their playbook. And the Queensland government is enabling their playbook at the moment by saying we can't make a decision because there's a court case on. There is no legal uh, impediment uh, from the Queensland government making the decision. People are losing their job right now because the Labor Party might talk the talk since the election, but they're, not, well, they're still walking order, the walk in the Australian Senator Greens. Canavan, order on my left. Order. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for, Family and, for Families and Social Services, Minister Rustin. There's a quarter of a million people on New Start who've been stuck on the payment for a year and are looking for a job. I've heard from some of them. They're the ones going to job interviews on foot because they can't afford the bus ticket. They turn up to every interview in the same shirt because they can't afford a new one. They're doing the right thing. They're having a go. They're trying to find work, and New Start's payment rate is making it harder, not easier. How is that fair? Is that deliberate? Will the government consider raising the rate of New Start to help people get off welfare and into a job? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her question. Um, quite clearly, the responsibility of the government um, when it comes to people who are not, uh, do not have a job is not just to provide them with the safety net payment to assist them um, during that time, but it's much more important that we also create jobs. And I think this government has a very strong track record of job creation. Um, over 1.4 million jobs have been created um, in the time since we've been in government, and we have a plan to create more. But more importantly, um, Senator Lambie, we also believe that the creation of pathways so that people who haven't got work can be connected to the jobs that are available 
are put in place, and also understanding that there are significant and different barriers to employment. And many people face different types of barriers. Some people face barriers because they're younger and don't have experience. Some people face barriers because of their mental health condition. Some people face barriers as, uh, for, as older Australians because um, they, uh, they find uh, themselves with some particularly unique barriers to employment. And that is why this government is absolutely committed to working on programs to break down those barriers so we can assist people in getting into jobs. Um, a couple of examples that the, this chamber may be interested in. A couple of weeks ago, I attended the Headspace in Northern Adelaide, a fantastic group of people working with young people who are presenting with mental health issues that are, are the barriers for them to be able to get work. I spoke to three fantastic young people, um, all of which who had presented to Headspace because they had either depression or anxiety issues. The three young people I spoke to, I'm very pleased to announce to the chamber, one of them is in full-time work, the second one is in part-time work and studying, and the third one, who had had significant anxiety issues, said that he was really excited because the following week he was actually feeling prepared and strong enough to attend his first job interview. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. It sounds like I won't hold my breath waiting for you guys to raise the rate of Newstart then. But why not raise the threshold that a new start recipient can earn before their payments start being cut? At the moment, someone on new start can only earn around $50 a week before their payments are reduced. If the best form of welfare is a job, why punish people on welfare who work anything more than three hours a week? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much. Um, one of the, and I thank Senator Lambie for her follow-up question. One of the things that the, uh, the research has shown is that people who work for a few hours a week are, very, are much more likely to be able to go on and actually get a job. So we will certainly be encouraging people um, to work. But what we are also encouraging through the process of, um, of the, the initiatives and the programs that we're putting in place is actually to provide funding for assistance to break down those barriers. Um, and some of those things may be as simple as providing people with assistance to write their CV, assistance to um, possibly how to dress to go to an interview, how to present at an interview, and in cases when they haven't um, got the resources to, uh, to also fund them uh, to be able to buy the appropriate clothes to attend an interview. So one of the things that we are absolutely focused on is making sure that there are a series of protections and programs that are wrapped around people who genuinely want to get a job, who find themselves in the difficult situation where they don't have a job. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Your government argued to lower taxes because a 37 per cent tax rate was discouraging people from work. Over 100,000 recipients lose part of their payment because they're working a few hours a week. And they're not losing 30 cents in the dollar, are they? No, they're losing between 50 and 60 cents. How is it fair that New Start recipients pay higher effective ta tax rates than anyone else in the country? Doesn't that discourage work too? It's quite simple. What is it going to cost you people? Absolutely nothing to let them work another few Order, hours a week Senator before Lambie, it hits their time for the question payments. Expired. Senator Rustin. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you, Senator Lambie, for your follow-up question. Um, obviously, um, this government doesn't see um, that the reduction in payment is, is a tax in the same way as you would determine a tax that somebody who is actually um, on, a, on an actual wage uh, or salary would pay tax. However. Um, what I would say is that I can give you an absolute commitment that this government is entirely focused on making sure that anybody who hasn't got a job, who wants a job, will be assisted in getting into work. It is the responsibility of order, Senator Lambie, on a point of order. Mr. President, I simply would like to know if the government would look at letting them work more hours before their payments are hit. It's simple. Would you at least consider it? Senator, Senator Lambie, again, I ask senators if they raise, stand on a point of order, they must actually make a point of order, not simply restate the question or ask for a preferred answer. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you, Mr President. Whilst I um, am not in a position to respond directly to the question that has been asked by Senator Lambie, the one thing I could assure this chamber is that this government is open to all suggestions where we can assist people from getting out of the state of unemployment into employment. So we, I'm more than happy to talk to, to Senator Lambie or anybody 
opposite Order. or anybody Senator in this Ruffton, place. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. I refer to his repeated assurances to the Senate that, and I quote, Minister Taylor has always declared his interests. Does the Minister stand by that statement? If so, can the Minister advise when Minister Taylor disclosed his interest in Jamland Proprietary Limited to the department which reports to him and is responsible for investigating that company for allegedly poisoning hectares of critically endangered grasslands? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for her question. Uh, Minister Taylor has, as he has made clear on repeated occasions now, and as I have made clear and others, uh, he has, in accordance with the rules of the parliament, made all necessary disclosures in relation to his interests. And with those interests, they have been well known. This has been well versed and well travelled. And indeed, his department, which Senator Wong referred to in her question, has made it very clear that their understanding is the approaches taken have all been completely appropriate, as they indeed have also been completely in accordance with the expectations of disclosure of the parliament and the ministerial standards. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I again refer to this minister's answer on the 24th of July, in which he took a question from me. Minister Taylor has always declared his interests full stop. Can the minister explain why an FOI decision by the Department of the Environment and Energy found no documents, I repeat, no documents, relating to any declaration of interest by Minister Taylor in Jamland Proprietary Limited? Why? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President. Senator Wong, who has been in this place for a long time, should know declarations are made to the parliament, to the House of Representatives. As Senator Wong, who was a cabinet minister during the six years of the Rudd and Gillard governments, I hate to have to remind her of uh, those governments, but Senator Wong, of course, would know the minister makes declarations to the, to the Prime Minister. Minister Taylor has made all of those declarations to the parliament, to the Prime Minister in accordance with parliamentary rules and the ministerial standards of accountability, exactly as you would expect. Those documents are held by the relevant departments and, indeed, in relation to the minister's disclosures to the parliament, are entirely on the public record. They don't have to be FOI'd from the Department of Environment. And they are published by the House of Representatives. Senator Wong, supplementary final Thank supplementary you, question. Mr President. I again remind this minister of his answer to this chamber, and I quote, Minister Taylor has always declared his interests. Unqualified, uh, unqualified answer to this chamber. Can the minister confirm that the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction has never declared his interest in jam land to the department? Can the minister explain why he believes that is appropriate? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, as we have outlined on numerous occasions in this place, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Taylor has disclosed his shareholdings as he is required to do so in his family company. He has disclosed his partnerships as he is re required to do so uh, to the parliament. He has disclosed his interests in all of the manners that are expected by the parliament very clearly. Senator Wong's question implies that these disclosures should go down multiple tiers or layers in terms of the interests of entities that the minister has already disclosed his order. interest in. Senator Birmingham, Senator, oh, oh, Senator Wong's on her feet. Senator Wong on a point of order. A point of order, direct relevance. It's not about subsidiary entities. It's about conflicts of interest. That's what the disclosure is about. Senator Birmingham. Now, Mr. President, as his department has made clear. They were well aware of any of these issues in terms of dealings that, uh, that have been had with the minister. They have acted in accordance with that. Issues of compliance have not been raised either by the minister nor with the minister. Uh, and I know many of these similar questions have been asked of the minister in the House of Representatives just recently. And indeed, as he's rightly pointed out, all he has done is sought to stand up for farmers in his electorate. And Labor are targeting him. Labor are targeting him. Yet, of course, Order, that same Labor Senator Party Birmingham, are more than happy time. to take bags full Order, of cash. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. Order. The time for the answer has expired. Order. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister please update the Senate on Australia's defence cooperation with Papua New Guinea, our closest neighbour, and how it is improving stability in our region? 
Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar for that uh, question. P PNG is a country that I, like uh, Senator Payne and many others in this uh, chamber, have a deep respect and affinity for. And I'm very proud to be able to report to this chamber that Australia's defence partnership with Papua New Guinea is long-standing. It is deep and built on uh, shared history, friendship, and I think, as Senator Payne would say, on rugby league. <laughs> uh, but my recent visit, uh, my five-day visit to PNG uh, last month for the 27th Ministerial Forum, really reinforced the strength of our maritime air infrastructure and people-to-people -people links. It also coincided uh, with the 40th anniversary of our defence cooperation program, Australia's largest at $42 million annually. And it was wonderful to see the breadth and depth of the relationships that extend between our two forces. In WeWAC, I opened Camp Key, a new PNGDF training facility at Moham Barracks, funded through the DCP. It was built by a a a ADF and PNGDF soldiers working side to side uh, under exercise Puk Puk. I also saw strong people-to-people -people links on display at WeWAC with fully integrated ADF and PNGDF platoons working side by side, fully integrated, to develop their skills and their joint capabilities as part of Exercise Wantok Warrior. Minister Saloma and I saw our air relationship in action when we travelled to his hometown of Okapa in the DCP-funded PNGDF helicopter. And wonderfully, it was flown by Army Lieutenant Joshua Ponderas, a pilot who completed his flying qualifications through the DCP. I'm confident that as partners, we are working together, defence force by defence force, to support Papua New Guinea's sovereign priorities in the areas of nation-building infrastructure towards a resilient and sovereign Papua New Guinea. Together, we are investing in the PNG of tomorrow uh, to support Order, a, Senator Reynolds, a sovereign time capability. Time answer has expired. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate Australia's maritime partnership with Papua New Guinea? Senator Reynolds. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thank the senator for that question, and yes, I can. Uh, during the visit, I saw that as maritime nations and near neighbours, Australia is working with PNG to address our shared maritime security challenges. During this visit, I travelled to Lombrum Naval Base on Manus Island, where Minister Saloma and I opened a new wharf facility that was funded through the DCP. It was a joyous occasion where I learned that my uh, Manusian dancing style is probably not quite up to scratch. But it was a joyous occasion. <laughs> but this uh, wharf will enable the PNGDF to berth and to maintain its new Guardian class patrol boats and also enhance its capability to protect its borders and its maritime resources. Our increased cooperation in Manus is a natural extension of our assistance and work together under our Pacific Maritime Security Program, a 30 year program to build the Papua New Guineans' at maritime capability. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on any other recent defence engagement activities in the Pacific? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and yes, I can. Uh, during this visit to the region, I also spent time in the Solomon Islands, where I was also able to witness fir firsthand our deep defence engagement between our two nations. I was so proud to observe the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force and the Australian Defence Force working together side by side to conduct exercise coast watches in the western and Chisel provinces of Solomon Islands. This important activity is now in its third year, and it develops our forces' ability to plan, to conduct and also to support remote policing and law enforcement activities, and also, importantly, to exercise humanitarian assistance and disaster relief responses. This year's exercise was specifically focused on strengthening the Solomon Islands' ability to police remote areas of its exclusive economic zone, a high priority for the Solomon Islands government that Australia was incredibly proud to support. And I'd thank all of our men and women in uniform, both in PNG and Solomon Islands, uh, doing the wonderful work Order. that they're doing. Senator Reynolds, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. motions to take note of answers. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Payne to the questions asked by Senators Watt and myself. Thank you. 
Well, this government's a little bit like the dog that caught the car, aren't they? They went barking, snapping through the election campaign, barking about the Labor Party, and then they won. And as it turned out, as it turned out, there was absolutely nothing in the bottom drawer. Because they've captured, they've captured the government benches, but they have absolutely no idea what to do about the circumstances facing our country. And arguably there is nothing more important, more critical, more urgent than a national government-led response to the economic circumstances that are facing us. And you'd think, you'd think that would be the priority coming into this week of parliamentary sittings. But is that what Mr Morrison told us he was interested in? No. Mr Morrison has boasted on this occasion, as he has done on every occasion since he took government, that he is coming into this parliament to set tests for Labor, coming into this parliament to play silly games, to construct bills that create wedges for other parliamentarians. What a sensible government would do, what a responsible government would do, what a grown-up government would do, is come into this chamber with a plan come into this parliament with a serious response to the challenges that face us. Because there are very, very serious economic challenges facing us, but sadly there is nothing, nothing on offer from the government benches. Economic growth is the slowest it has been in, in, in 10 years since the GFC. Wages are stagnant and 1.8 million Australians are out of work or looking for more work. Household debt is high, living standards are going backwards, we have seen the first per capita income recession in over a decade, productivity has declined every quarter, every quarter for the last four quarters. There is a lot to do, a lot before us, and it is not as though solutions are not on offer. The Reserve Bank has been particularly engaged, the Reserve Bank Governor, in putting forward his views about what needs to happen. He is urging the government to take action, to bring forward expenditure on infrastructure, and still Mr Morrison fails to act. Seven times, seven times since the election in May, the Reserve Bank has called on the government to fast-track infrastructure spending to stimulate the economy. Seventeen times in the last two years. And you'd think that would be a wake-up call. Wouldn't you? You'd think that would be a message that something needs to be done. But right now the government is sitting on their hands. And let's be clear about what the Reserve is saying. They are saying that with interest rates at very, very low levels, a third of what they were during the GFC, the capacity for monetary policy to respond to the conditions is very constrained. Government needs to step in. That is the message that the Reserve Bank is sending the government. And so it might have been the subject for a serious response. It might have been the subject for a parliamentary response, but that's not what we've got. All we've got is endless political game playing. And I guess that's what you get when you elect an ad, man, an ad man as the Prime Minister. You don't get someone engaged in serious policy problems. You don't get grown-up government. You just get a silly campaign. And unfortunately for all the Australians out there who are doing it tough, who find themselves struggling to pay bills, wondering if they're going to have a job, wondering how to get more work. For those people, they'll find no, no answers whatsoever from the people on the other side of this chamber. The Master Builders Association were out there today. In the last little while, the excuse offered by the government for why they can't do anything to bring forward infrastructure funding uh, is because there are constraints. Well, they've absolutely belled the cat on that one, haven't they? Because the Master Builders Association have made it very clear that, yes, there are some constraints, constraints in Sydney and Melbourne, but in a range of other sectors there is plenty of capacity and there is the opportunity to stimulate the economy in our regions, in places other than Melbourne and Sydney. And for a government that likes to pride itself, that talks a big game about the regions, it is incredible that that advice from the Masters of Builders Association isn't being he heeded. It's the same advice, incidentally, that they've heard from the, the RBA, that there is room to stimulate the economy. Why won't they act? Well, it's because they have no plan. They have no vision. They are stuck with an economic textbook that somebody gave them in 1980, and they don't have the imagination to adapt themselves to current circumstances. 
They're playing political games instead of dealing with the very real economic challenges that face us Thank now. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Well, it is terrific news to hear that those on the other side know that there are other regions apart from Sydney and Melbourne. Very exciting news because when we went to the last election, the one that the uh, Australian people made a very clear decision. On the 18th of May, they decided that they wanted no part in the economic management that was put forward by the Labor government, a uh, Labor opposition. They made it very clear that they did not want hundreds of millions of dollars of new taxes. They made it very clear they did not want an economy based around unachievable renewable energy targets. They made it very clear they did not want the economy smashed and jobs snatched from Australians by the opposition's plan. What they did want is a sensible, practical economic plan which was presented by Morrison and this government. And what they got is a government that has provided certainty, that has provided stability, that has have a, does have a plan, and a plan that was taken to the Australian people, a plan that was put forward in the budget earlier this year a plan that foresaw that Australia uh, does have challenges that we were going to face, but that we were steadfastly getting on with implementing that plan. And the proof of that plan and that it is moving forward is the Australian people's acceptance and understanding that there are challenges ahead, but we have just seen that the Australian economy has completed its 28th consecutive year of economic growth, a record that is unmatched by any other developed economy. The proof is in the scoreboard. We just have to look at those numbers to understand that this is an economy that has survived despite economic headwinds. And it is a reminder that it is important that we continue to talk positive, positively and support those businesses who are out employing Australians who are providing real jobs, who are providing the taxes that provide the services that we so enjoy. And it is important to, to talk up that resilience and to repudiate all of those who have sought to talk it down. In the June quarter, real GDP grew by 0.5 per cent to be 1.4 per cent higher through the year. In year average terms, real GDP grew by 1.9 per cent in 2018-19. It is slowly uh, below the budget forecast of 2.25 per cent, but which is also in year average terms. But it is important that we remember that it is Australians who build the economy. It is Australian businesses that employ the, employ the uh, jobs. And it is the lack of flexibility from Labor, their lack of understanding of the risks that Australians make in operating these businesses and employing people, and it is these Australians who need to be recognised, who need to be supported, and their decision to support the Morrison government is one that should not be disregarded. They had a clear, the Morrison government had a clear plan to take to the economy, one that we are delivering, and as I said before, it is about certainty, it is about stability, and it is about having a plan in face of a challenging world environment but one that we knew was coming and one that we are clearly working towards. So this contrast is between a stable, united government getting on with a job, with a clear plan, delivering on promises that were made, versus a Labor Party that is conflicted on policy and tarnished by scandal. It's about certainty versus uncertainty, stability and predictability versus chaos and confusion. Labor just doesn't seem to know what it stands for or whose side they are on, which means you won't know what you get from one week to the next. On tax and the budget, on border protection, on union power, on work over welfare, Labor can't tell you what they believe or whose sides they are on. There is no certainty and there is no consistency. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Interesting to note that Senator Macdonald couldn't even get her five minutes of, uh, of time right through. But I listened to that contribution and I thought, well, hang on a second. You're in government. We're asking you a question, a legitimate question, which is asked by a lot of commentators in the economic space. You're looking at an economy which is faltering. You're looking at an economy 
that has got some positivity in the mineral sector, which has been buoyant and which has kept the place afloat. Now, if that does not continue, what are your plans? And their plans are that somehow or other it is the Labor Party's policy fault. Well, you have been in government for six years. Have a look down the body path. Where are you going? Where are you going economically? A legitimate question asked, like, I think, last night of the Prime Minister was, are you actually compounding the problem here by chasing a surplus in a stagnating and flat economy? Are you actually going to drive a bit of a recessionary impact by chasing a surplus at all costs? Now, we all know a surplus in a rising economy is the holy grail. And every household knows that. If you've got more coming in and you put a bit aside for a rainy day, that's the holy grail. If you've got less coming in and you have to buy less or do less to put a bit aside, well, that's not you know, the holy grail. And an economy as large as Australia and the impact that this government has on the economy in its terms of spending, if you're chasing a surplus at all costs, at all costs, so you can tick a box saying, I wanted a surplus, and it is actually impacting negatively on the economy. That's dumb. But Senator Macdonald hinted at chaotic policies on this side. Well, I don't think we have to go back too far when the chaos that the Morrison, Morrison Abbott government was creating in the community was rampant right across. Now, it's true you've won an election on May 19, but don't be blaming us for your activity or lack of activity in the economy. We're the opposition. We're asking legitimate questions. What are your plans? What are your plans about stagnant wage growth? What are your plans about declining used cars, uh, new car sales? What are your plans for a declining activity in the building sector? What are your plans right across the whole economy? And if it's true that we've had 28 plus years of un uninterrupted economic growth. And a lot of that, some commentators will argue, is attributable to our reasonably high levels of immigration. Immigrants come to this country and contribute effectively from day one. They build stuff, they buy stuff, they are very, very beneficial to the economy. <coughs> this government is looking at lower forecasts from immigration. So you've got a fixation with a surplus at all costs. You've got declining economic indicators across many facets of the economy, buoyed only by the mining sector. You've got a projected lowering of the immigration levels. All of these could well create the circumstances where, unfortunately, we may go into recession, two quarters of negative growth. Our, fact, our, our indicators are not that high at the moment. You know, we're, not that, we're not going that well. And when we ask legitimate questions about what is this government's plan, their plan is, well, if you lot were in power, it would be worse. Well, I've got to say, that's not a plan. Is that a plan that you're going to take to people when they're thrown out of a job? If 750 people lose their job at Virgin or other companies start laying people off, the plan the government's got is, well, don't worry, because if the Labor Party was in power, you'd be hurting more. Six years you've been there, you've got another three years to go. What is your plan if this economy tanks nosedives? Are you going to remain fixated with a surplus at all costs and punish everybody who falls down in the economy with no plans of you know, floating a bit or putting a bit of uh, expenditure here? Infrastructure, the classic place to go and stimulate a flat economy, you have no plans to increase that. Oh, we're doing well on that, we're doing well here. Well, there are plenty of people, plenty of independent economic commentators saying there are enough warning signals here. Flat, declining wage growth, used cars, uh, new car sales down, the building sector's down. Around you, there are enough signs to say you should have a fiscal plan. And when we ask, and other commentators ask, what are you doing, you should have a competent answer, not to say you lot were going to be worse. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, uh, I will acknowledge that Senator Gallagher, for, for, from those opposite, is the first one who actually acknowledges the fact there was an election a few short weeks ago, and the Australian people spoke. And the Australian people spoke extraordinarily decisively, with two competing economic policies 
up for grabs. They had a policy of the politics of envy, big government socialism from those opposite, and they had a very clear plan for keeping the Australian economy strong and resilient in the face of some serious international economic headwinds from this government. The only people in denial in this place are those opposite. They're in denial about what happened a few short weeks ago when the Australian people spoke. Uh, the verdict of the Australian people was very clear. We took a plan to the election, a plan that, as I read out in this place yesterday, a media release from the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, which outlined the economic headwinds that Australia faced, a media release from before the last election that set out how this government's plan to address those issues, to keep those 28 years of economic growth on track for the future, to see our economy keep growing, to lower taxes, to keep funding those essential services that Australians require, to keep people in jobs, to grow jobs. A comprehensive economic plan from this government. And what do we hear from those opposite? We hear about floundering, we hear about faltering, we hear about stagnation, but more than anything else we hear them falling back into that sad old pattern of the politics of envy where they always go when they're in trouble. It's the politics of envy. This government is delivering. It's delivering on the $100 billion infrastructure plan over the next 10 years. Record high number of people in jobs. Uh, unemployment rose by, in, the, in the latest quarter by 42,300 in May of this year uh, to a record high of 12,868,000 plus jobs. Those opposite ever talk about jobs? Of course they don't, because jobs growth is fundamental. It's about reducing those on welfare. We want to have less people on welfare, more people in work, which is exactly what this government has been delivering over the last six years, and we took to the Australian people a very clear plan for keeping on delivering those new jobs into the Australian economy and continuing to see less people need the support of government via income support. Uh, 230,000 fewer people dependent on income support uh, uh, than four years ago. That is an outstanding result. That is 230,000 individuals, uh, hundreds of thousands of families who have, have moved from the welfare system into work uh, and who are now playing an active role in the Australian economy. Full-time unemployment now comprises uh, 70, almost 74 per cent of the employment growth over the last year. We're putting people into full-time jobs. Business is giving people the opportunity to gain access to those full-time jobs, which is the best thing that an economy can give to someone, to get them out of the welfare system, to get them out of dependency on uh, government assistance, get them into a job. Uh, we've seen recently in the Hilda report mean disposable household income rising to 55,000 in 2017. Uh, to 55,200 in 2017, from 54,680 in 2016. In fact, the largest increase in mean disposable household income since the year 2012-13. Wages are growing at the highest rate since December 2014 at 2.4%. Inflation is currently 1.3%. We've seen that wages are growing at their fastest place in uh, private sector wages are growing at their fastest pace in four years. So once again, we see those opposite falling back into a level of confusion, of floundering, of faltering themselves as they don't know where to go following their election defeat. They fall back into the politics of envy. They deny the verdict of the Australian people a few short weeks ago. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. Uh, it's one of the things I've noticed uh, over the course of the last couple of months, I've been in the Senate for just a few moments, really, is the refusal of those opposite to acknowledge the basic facts 
uh, in the Australian economy, a refusal to engage with um, the real issues. And as I said yesterday, that really is a precondition for being effective. Actually acknowledge what the problem is, work out what the sources of the problem are, and then act. The truth is, wage growth is at its lowest level in recorded history. Uh, since, since wage growth was being measured, we haven't had a period where it's grown so little. In fact, we've achieved a small economic miracle in the Australian context. We've got skills shortages and low wage growth. We've got unemployment hovering stubbornly between 5 and 6 per cent, skills shortages and low wage growth all at the same time. Uh, that isn't supposed to be a feature of a modern economy, but I think it's becoming the new normal under the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government. Uh, it, shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't occur. Uh, profits rising around about 4.5 per cent over the course of the last quarter, but wages have grown at half or 25 per cent of the rate of profit growth uh, over the last couple of years. Now, it is true that profit growth is more volatile, and you can't look at quarter by quarter measures of firm profitability. And it is important that Australian firms remain profitable over a sustained period of time. But what's happened clearly over the course of the last period is the wage profit share, the wages share of the economy has declined year on year on year. And there are serious consequences for our economy, serious cons consequences for our democracy uh, if that continues to occur. As I said before, skill shortages, unemployment remaining where it is, these are the conditions where the economy and workers ought to be banking wage increases. It's, the the, it's the right time in the economic cycle for workers' wages to rise uh, and for people to build a decent standard of living. We are missing an opportunity to build incomes and the wealth of ordinary Australians because the government's willful blindness on these questions. There is no wages policy. In fact, the only alternative that's been offered is that the current settings are a deliberate design feature designed to keep wages low. And you'd have to say, despite uh, the uh, Leader of the House's denials, that that is the logic of the industrial relations system from 1996 to 2019, of hyper-regulation of collective bargaining, denying people the capacity to effectively bargain and to lift their wages. Um, we, we are operating in an environment where every economic indicator is pointing in the wrong direction. Vehicle sales, down. Retail turnover, down. Labor productivity, down. Household debt, up. GDP growth, decreasing uh, year on year. In fact, some economists say that we're in a per capita recession, and apparently that is cause for celebration on the other side. Job ads, down. Household income, down. Underemployment, up. Uh, the long-term unemployment rate over the course of the last few years tracking up. Electricity prices across the national electricity market tracking up 158 per cent. Now, these are all domestic factors that the government has some control over, that the government should have a policy to deal with. Their only plan is politics and to point the finger at global economic headwinds. Now, I appreciate it that there is not a yachting analogy that the crowd opposite wouldn't love to get hold of, but it's not an excuse for economic failure. It's not an excuse for a policy agenda that's run out of steam. Uh, and it is time that the government turned up to the parliament with a plan that's about the economy and jobs and not just about politics. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.
Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers uh, asked by Senator De Natale. The, the head to of the which minister? It was to Minister Canavan. Thank you. Deputy President, the head of the Tasmanian Fire Union said there's no climate deniers on the end of a fire hose. Senator Zentali asked a very clear question today. He asked why the Prime Minister and the Minister wouldn't meet with the 23 chiefs of emergency services representing every state and territory in this country who wanted to talk to the Prime Minister about acting on climate change. Have no doubt what we are seeing in Queensland, the catastrophe, the tragedy we are seeing unfolding in Queensland, as we have seen in other states around this beautiful country in recent years, is a climate crisis. It is climate catastrophe. This is what a future of a warming planet looks like increasingly frequent and severe extreme weather events, hotter temperatures, more drought, more dry lightning strikes, more cyclones, more hurricanes, more variability in our weather, more extremes. We've just seen the biggest hurricane on record ever recorded in the Bahamas just a week ago, after an exceptionally devastating cyclone or hurricane season in the US last year. We have seen unprecedented global marine heat waves right around the world. No one's denying any more, except maybe a few cynical climate deniers in the Liberal National Party, that half the Great Barrier Reef has bleached and perished. I recently surfed coral reefs in the Maldives, where the locals were telling us that 90 per cent of their reefs died from the same heat waves. Indeed, UNESCO's 28 listed coral reefs around the world that have World Heritage value are in many cases worse than the barrier reef. This is climate crisis. This is climate catastrophe. And I ask the chamber and those in the chamber today, if we can't talk about climate change and how, how we are going to act to prevent these kind of catastrophes in the future from happening right now, while they're happening, then when? When can we discuss this? When can we have a mature debate about the facts before us? If we can't listen to the frontline personnel, the brave Australians, men and women who go and fight these fires, the professionals, the unions, the volunteer firefighters. If we can't listen to them, in fact, our Prime Minister can't even meet with them to discuss action on climate, then what hope do we have? Why is it that we are sticking our head in the sand in the place where the levers are pulled and the decisions are made? Well, Mr President, I am going to start using the words climate criminals from here on in, because I have no doubt that in the future, future generations will look at decision makers who stuck their head in the sand or decision makers who deliberately overlooked taking effective action on climate change because it wasn't in their political interest to do so. I'm going to start calling you climate criminals, because that's what you are. When we see tragic loss of life, and loss of property, when we see the tragic loss of entire ecosystems because of inaction, there's no other way to describe that except criminality. And I have no doubt that future generations are going to look back on those who stood in the way of action as being criminals. Not those brave souls out there who have joined groups like the Extinction Rebellion who are protesting and taking action for their future, because they have no other alternative, because this place and this government has not listened. For those school kids and their parents and all the bank employees and others who are about to strike on the 20th of September, because they care about an increasing frequency of catastrophic events like we've seen in Queensland. They are the ones who are sending us a message and we should be listening. At a time 
of crisis, we must confront it. We must talk about climate change and how we are going to take effective action. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices?